Welcome to the weekly online worship service at Christ Alone Lutheran Church in Mequon and Thienesville, Wisconsin. This is the first weekend in the season of Lent, a somber season and yet a joyful season as we think of how our Lord goes forth victoriously to fight our enemies and give us the gift of eternal life. May God bless you this day as you focus on that Savior. Let's begin with our opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Would that broke? 
Let us pray. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word. And when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson is that powerful account of the Lord testing his dear son, Abraham, and calling him to sacrifice his son. This is from Genesis chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up. And there, in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The word of the Lord. We join in singing Psalm 6.
The epistle this day, comforting words from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The word of the Lord. We speak the verse of the day. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Our gospel lesson for this day speaks of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1. At once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. We now sing our hymn of the day, If God Himself Be For Me.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through Jesus his Son, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. We're used to seeing Jesus depicted as a gentle figure, and rightly so. He said, I am gentle and humble of heart. Yet, do you ever think of him as a soldier, a warrior? That also is a biblical image of the Messiah. Think of Psalm 24, where it is asked, Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Or Isaiah 42, verse 13, The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior he will stir up his zeal. With a shout he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Or Isaiah 63, Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, riding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save, says the Lord. These also are important images of Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, and each year during these six weeks of Lent, we notice a lot more tension, a lot more conflict in our Savior's ministry. Conflict with envious Jewish leaders. Conflict with demons afflicting the land. Conflict, most of all, with Satan himself, whose name means enemy or adversary. Let's begin these Sundays in Lent by watching with joy as our King Jesus goes off to war for us. The evangelist Mark has a way of writing things with fewer words than Matthew, Luke, and John. Short And to the point, that's why his gospel has only 16 chapters, while the others have over 20. But there's a beauty in his brevity. He has just gotten done recording the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River when he records four powerful facts. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. Did you notice something? It was God's Holy Spirit who rested on him in the form of a dove and filled him with power that sent him out, literally drove him out, away from the crowds, away from the comforts of the towns, away from food and sustenance, and into the desert. It's as if the Spirit was saying, Jesus, Son of God, your work is now beginning. No one else can do it in your place. You must go through this. And what did he have to do? Well, Mark continues. As he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. Mark does not go into the detail that others give about these 40 days, giving examples of how the devil was tempting Jesus. But it's clear that Satan was continually pounding at Jesus in his weakened, starving, deserted state, with temptations to sin against God. He must have known that Jesus' work as the Holy One of God was to remain holy. If he could just get him to sin, even once, he could not be the innocent lamb whose sacrifice would take away the sin of the world. Mark continues, He was with the wild animals. Now, that's something no one else mentions. But it's important because it highlights just how alone he was. If you've ever camped out in a wilderness area, you know how the hair on your neck stands up when you start hearing animals making noise near your camp at night as you're lying in your tent. What's out there? Jesus had no comfort of human companionship. He was doing battle alone, vulnerable. And finally, Mark says, and angels attended him. When his trial was over, God himself sent his heavenly messengers, the angels, to attend to his needs, probably with food and comfort. And so his battles begin. Now, I don't know about you, but this is one of the hardest parts of Jesus' ministry for me to comprehend. How about you? I mean, how can the Son of God, whose very nature is holy and pure, even as true man, truly be tempted to sin like a normal human being? And second, 
Did Satan really think he could get God's own son to sin against him? Or was he just stupid? Well, <clears throat> sin certainly is stupid. And those who give themselves over to sin are made stupid by sin. There is a stupidity in us, too, when we listen to the devil's temptations to act against the will of God. But what we do know is that Jesus was really, truly tempted to sin as our perfect substitute. The Holy Spirit forced him into a situation where he demonstrated his faithfulness to his Father. That's what the writer to the Hebrews said in chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Did you get that? Your Savior knows exactly what it's like to have Satan try to pull you away from God and his love. He really suffered, and he really successfully opposed the miserable liar Satan. What we find especially interesting is the kind of temptations the devil tried to use on Jesus, as we hear written in the other gospel accounts. Every one of them basically poked him with the lure of happiness. Oh, Jesus, you must be hungry after all these 40 days. As the Son of God, why don't you just turn these stones into bread? Oh, Jesus, you need to become more famous and known to the crowds. That's important. If you're God's son, why don't you jump off the pinnacle of the temple in front of them all? After all, God promises he will command his angels to guard you so that you don't even strike your foot against a stone. Hey, Jesus, I know you want to conquer this world and have all its splendor. It all belongs to me. I'll just give it to you if you just bow down and worship me. No questions asked. These were real temptations, even for God's Son. Any one of them could shipwreck him and disqualify him to be our holy sacrifice. But what did our king do? In his weakened, emaciated state, after starving for 40 days, he fought using the sword of the Spirit, the very words that God had given. He probably could hardly think straight, much less walk a straight line by that time. But God's word sustained and, and protected him. It is written, he said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The same devil who could quote Psalm 91 to Jesus no doubt also remembered God's angry words to him in the Garden of Eden. He, the coming Messiah, Eve's own descendant, will crush your head. And he was terrified. There was no way he could beat God and God's Son in a head-on confrontation. But maybe, just maybe, he thought he could derail his plan by causing Jesus to stumble. His plan failed, and Jesus clearly won the battle. And let's not forget, it wasn't just his battle. It was your battle, too. If your sins could be held against you in the court of God's righteousness, you would stand condemned forever by his holiness. But Jesus made sure that would never happen. His obedience became your obedience. His righteousness became your righteousness. His victory over Satan became your victory over Satan. Remember the next time Satan comes to you with his slick lie, Oh, God surely wants you to be happy. It's okay if you disobey what he says. Does that thought attack you? God just wants me to be happy? He doesn't want me to have to put up with hardship or devotion or thanklessness or pain? When that thought attacks you, Think of the Savior who answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only, and follow the victor. Your real happiness, 
is completely wrapped up in his obedience for you. Now, the next words also strike us. Mark writes, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. Again, the Gospel writer Mark really shortens things up. We might get the idea that all this happened just a day or two later. But it's after John the Baptist was put into prison. A lot happened before that. Jesus called his first disciples. He turned water into wine at the wedding he attended in Cana of Galilee. He cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. He had his long discussion with Nicodemus at night. He began mission work in Samaria with the woman at Jacob's well. He healed the official's son. And at the pool of Bethesda, he healed a cripple. <coughs> he preached in Judea. It's at least several months later that all of this happened. Now, his cousin and herald John was imprisoned, and Jesus began his Galilean ministry. Like a conquering hero, fueled by zeal for his father and his love for the people, he goes up north in Galilee and begins loudly proclaiming the message of gospel, of good news. Listen to what he says. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. God's sense of timing was absolutely perfect. After thousands of years of witnessing to the world about his coming son, and you could say after centuries of carefully preparing his chosen people Israel to be the womb in this world by which he would arrive, the time had come. God had fulfilled his promise of entering his dear created world to appear to sinners, and he came bringing a divine kingdom, not one to administer small parcels of real estate on earth, but one to rule in people's hearts, not a kingdom with weak armies to defend borders against jealous neighbors, but with heavenly hosts led by the king over all kings to defeat the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, St. Paul says. This was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, the Son of God himself. Now, in a normal earthly kingdom, you're either born a citizen by parents who are citizens already, or you have to somehow work your way or pay your way into becoming a citizen. But that's not the way it works in God's kingdom of salvation. Here, the only way is the way Jesus invited the people of Galilee. Repent and believe the good news. Repent. That's the word that means have a change of mind, a change of heart. You have always loved sin and its lying invitation to pleasure. But if you would have my kingdom, Jesus said, you must turn away from your love of self and what you want. You must turn from sin and turn instead to me, your king, your savior. For only I can free you from eternal death by the power of my divine sacrifice for you. Can I share with you an interesting comparison I ran across made by author Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy? He wrote this. As a child, I lived in an area of southern Missouri where electricity was available only in the form of lightning. We had more of that than we could use. But in my senior year of school, the Rural Electrification Administration extended its lines into the area where we lived, and electrical power became available to households and farms. Now, when those lines came by our farm, a very different way of living presented itself. Our relationships to fundamental aspects of life, daylight and dark, clean and dirty, work and leisure, preparing food and preserving it, could then be vastly changed for the better. But we still had to believe in the electricity and its arrangements, understand them, and take the practical steps involved in relying on it and bringing it into our homes. 
You may think the comparison rather crude, he goes on, and, and in some ways, some respects, it is. But it will help us to understand Jesus' basic message about the kingdom of, of the heavens. If we pause to reflect on those farmers who, in effect, heard the message, repent, for electricity is at hand. Repent, or turn from their kerosene lamps and lanterns, their ice boxes and cellars, their scrub boards and rug beaters, their woman-powered sewing machines and their radios with dry cell batteries. Turn away from them and enjoy electricity. The power that could make their lives far better was right there near them. By making relatively simple arrangements, they could utilize it. Strangely, a few did not accept it. They were suspicious. They did not enter the kingdom of electricity. Some just didn't want to change. They were used to the old way. Others could not afford it, or so they thought. They didn't comprehend. It came to them freely. So it is that Jesus comes bringing a kingdom that is far better than the kingdom we are naturally familiar with. He brings the kingdom of heaven to humankind. There are no restrictions in this kingdom, no class distinctions, no divisions of rich and poor, no racial or gender or age favoritism. There is no cost to us. That cost is entirely borne by God's Son. It is a kingdom that brings hope, peace with God, and peace with self. Because of that, it also brings peace and love in relations with one another. It is the greatest of kingdoms. But there is only one way to enter in, to hate what we have become in sincere disgust with our sins that come so freely and naturally, and to love and trust what God has become for us, our Savior in the flesh, our brother. It is to repent and believe. Some will not accept him because they are too much in love with themselves and their own pleasure. Some will not believe that such a thing could come, come to us so freely of cost, simply by faith. Some will lose out by their own foolish blindness. May that never be you. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, he will not return lowly and gentle, meek and abused. St. John said of him when he saw him, I saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. We will see him as the conquering warrior he truly is, and that he truly always has been. Until that day, let the eyes of your heart see him conquering sin for you in all his holiness and proclaiming his victory to the world. For his victory over Satan and sin is yours forever. Amen. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
We pray. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful, even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who invites us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. We close with the hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father.
Thank you again for joining us this day. It's a real joy that you permit us into your living rooms and homes for this online worship service. May God bless your worship of him. And we invite you to join us again for a live streamed service on Wednesdays during the season of Lent at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Just go to our website at ChristAloneWells.org. God bless you as you follow him.